Okay. Um, so, hey uh, everyone, my name is Dylan. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, people's perceptions of their own social mobility and how that relates to their emotional well-being. So I'm going to stick along the same theme, obviously, but kind of talk a little bit about uh, these consequences of our mobility beliefs. So as we've already seen today, perceptions of, or sorry, social mobility is just the ability for people to move up or down the social ladder. Uh, and no one quite exemplifies the extremes of social mobility uh, like somebody like Oprah. So Oprah was born into poverty. Uh, she was raised by a single mother wearing dresses made out of potato sacks. And now she's one of the richest and most powerful people in North America. So while Oprah's story really exemplifies this American dream that anybody can move up the social ladder if they're willing to put in the work, uh, the reality of social mobility is substantially different. So this is some of the most recent data. This is the same data from, the, uh, from Chai's talk about uh, from the Pew Charitable Trusts. And what this is showing you specifically is that people who were born in the bottom income quintile had a disproportionately high chance of spending their entire life in that quintile. So this column is all the people born in the bottom, and each box, stack box there, is their chances of ending up in any given quintile over the course of their lifetime. So you can see that about 40% of the people born in the bottom were still there as adults, about a quarter of the people moved up one quintile, and so on. So this is what the rest of the data look like, and you can see, looking at the middle three quintiles, that there's a little bit more room for movement uh, for these guys. So, for example, if you look specifically at the middle quintile, you see they have a pretty even chance of ending up in any uh, income quintile over the course of their life. However, the people at the ends experience what Pew calls stickiness at the ends, meaning just that they have this uh, disproportionately high chance of spending their entire life in the quintile in which they were born. So, uh, I'm going to talk, so this is all, uh, there's tons of research that's been done on the actual levels of social mobility over time by economists and sociologists and what have you, um, but we're more interested in the psychological consequences of how people see their own social mobility. Um, so I'm going to talk today about four different studies in which we explored this question. So the first two studies were just correlational studies where we looked at the relationship between perceptions of people's own social mobility and well-being. And then in studies three and four, we manipulated perceptions of social mobility to see how this would impact people's current emotions. So there's a couple of different ways that this relationship, there's at least a couple of different ways that this relationship between uh, perceptions of social mobility and well-being could exist. And the first is that uh, on one hand, and quite somewhat uh, counterintuitively, it's possible that people are happier when they actually see low social mobility. That is, that they're unlikely to move from their current social standing. Uh, so for example, in one study in the past, researchers found that people who had irreversible colostomies actually reported higher life satisfaction and higher quality of life than people who had reversible colostomies. Now this was because people who had the irreversible procedure were better able to uh, just accept their new position in life and just kind of adapt and uh, were better able to return to this higher happiness set point. Whereas the people who had the uh, reversible procedure were just constantly clinging on to this idea that maybe one day my situation is going to get better, and once uh, and being um, and, and clinging to this hope uh, prevents you from adapting and, and returning to a higher happiness set point. So it's possible that people who uh, are constantly just striving towards this ideal of climbing the social ladder and it's just slightly out of reach uh, aren't able to adapt and therefore feel less happy. Uh, on the other hand, people generally exhibit an, an optimistic bias such that we like to believe that good things are more likely to happen to us and bad things are less likely to happen to us in the future. Uh, and this optimism bias has been linked to increased well-being in the past as well. So for example, uh, in a study done, of, done on bypass surgery patients, they found that people who reported uh, more optimism the day before the surgery were actually uh, happier and more relieved a week following the surgery and even more than that, in a five-year uh, a follow-up five years later, the people who were more optimistic were still more likely to report that their life was more interesting and free from stress and pressure and what have you. So it's possible then that people are just generally pretty optimistic about their future ability to climb the social ladder, and this sustained optimism uh, leads to increased well-being. So our first question then is, 
are perceptions of higher social mobility actually associated with higher levels of well-being? And we predicted specifically that yes, people who saw themselves as having more upward mobility uh, would indeed be happier. So we first tested this in a correlational study of 100 Americans on MTERP. Uh, we first had them fill out the positive and negative affect schedule, uh, where they just reported their current emotion by indicating how much they were feeling each of 20 different emotions right then and there. So for example, excited, uh, upset, alert, and what have you. Uh, and we then had people report their mobility perceptions. So they did this by just giving us their perceived odds of ending up in any of the five income quintiles uh, over the next 10 years. So to look at the relationship between these two things, we conducted a partial correlation controlling for some very well-known predictors of uh, well-being, which are age and income. And what we found is that, indeed, people who saw themselves as having more upward social mobility uh, reported higher positive affect. So this is some initial evidence that there is, in fact, a relationship uh, between perceptions of high social mobility and higher well-being. Uh, however, we decided to replicate this study using a different measure of social mobility. So in the second study, we recruited another 193 Americans, again from MTurk. The methodology was the same. We had them fill out the panis and then give us their mobility perceptions uh, for themselves. Uh, for, this, uh, for the mobility perceptions this time, however, we first had people tell us their relative uh, income percentile. So where are you on, on the scale of American adults now? And so, for example, this guy says he's right smack dab in the middle. He's at the 50th percentile of American adults. And then we said, okay, where do you think you're going to be 10 years from now? And this guy, he says, I'm going to be at the 70th percentile. So I'm going to move up 20 percentile points over the next 10 years. And we just took the difference between these two ratings as a measure of mobility. So, for example, or perceived mobility, sorry. So, for example, this guy, he thinks uh, he's going to be uh, you know, 70 minus 50. So... Uh, mobility score of point. Uh, we did the same thing in this study as we did in study one, where we just conducted the partial correlation. Uh, and what we found is that, again, the same thing. People who saw themselves as having more upward mobility also reported uh, more positive affect. Uh, one thing that's interesting, though, is how this relationship might exist across the income spectrum. So if we look here at the blue bars, what we see is the exact mobility perception measure that I just described. So future percentile uh, minus current percentile. And what we see is that as income increases across the bottom, as we move up over the quintiles, perceptions of upward social mobility steadily decreases. However, it never really crosses zero. So even people who are already at the top, who are in the top 20% of American adults, still think that they're just kind of not going to fall down the social ladder at all. And then when we asked them, so what do you think the chances you have of uh, the chances you have of moving up the social ladder even further? So out of 100%, what are the chances you think you have of moving up? And this is what we see on the green bars here, and you can see that it's a relatively uh, flat line. So even people who are in the top 20% already still think that they have about a 50% chance of climbing even higher uh, than they already are. So. Studies one and two give some uh, initial evidence, and using different measures of mobility, that perceptions of high social mobility for yourself are indeed related to higher emotional well-being. And we've seen some initial evidence that this might be because people generally don't think they're going to fall down the social ladder, regardless of uh, how wealthy they already are. Of course, these first two studies are just correlational, so uh, while it's possible that perceiving oneself as, as having higher social mobility might lead to increased happiness, it's also possible that happier people are just more likely to see themselves as having a, a um, bright future where they can climb the social ladder more easily. Uh, or, of course, there could be some third variable that's causing both of these things. So the second question, then, is does perceiving high social mobility actually lead to higher well-being? So we first tested this by recruiting uh, another 455 adults, and we randomly assigned them to read one of three different articles in which we described uh, articles that we wrote describing different levels of social mobility. So this is what the articles look like. And there's the key differences in a couple spots. So uh, the first key difference was in the title. So this article is describing high social mobility. And you see it's titled uh, Mobile Indeed. Uh, the article describing low social mobility was titled An Immobile Society. Uh, the other key differences came in the last paragraph. So this is uh, some excerpts of what we wrote. 
Um, so for example, we said, recent research from a group of American economists from Harvard University and the University of California, Berkeley, has shown that social mobility across North America is actually either very low, actually average, or very healthy. It seems for the younger generations in North America that their American dream will remain just that, will be met with a yawn, or is as relevant today as it was in the frontier days. So we had our 455 participants. We randomly assigned them to read one of these three articles. And then again, we had them fill out the panis just like in studies one and two. And what we saw, consistent with the first two studies, was that people who read about high social mobility actually reported increased positive affect relative to those who read about low social mobility. Uh, now, the only significant difference here was between the high and low mobility conditions. Um, moreover, we also found that people who read the high social mobility article reported lower negative affect relative to those who read about low mobility. Again, the only uh, significant difference here was between the high and low mobility conditions. So, study three gives us some initial causal evidence that perceiving high social mobility actually leads to higher well-being. But this study, as with studies one and two, was conducted on MTurk, so we wanted to uh, replicate it using perhaps a, more, a broader and more comprehensive sample. So, we recruited another 430 American adults, this time using uh, a national panel survey. Specifically, we recruited people evenly across all the income quintiles. So we had an even number of people in the bottom, second, middle, fourth, and top quintiles. Moreover, since the only significant differences in study three were between the uh, high and low income, or high and low social mobility articles, uh, that's what we chose to focus on. So we randomly assigned the participants to read either the low mobility or the high mobility article. Uh, and then again, we had them complete the panels. And what we found, consistent with study three, is that participants who read the high mobility article, again, they reported um, more positive affect, as well as lower negative affect, relative to those who read the low social mobility article. So studies three and four now uh, give us some causal evidence across two different studies, suggesting that uh, perceiving high social mobility, in fact, leads to higher well-being. But again, one interesting thing to consider is how this exists across the income spectrum. So it doesn't make a whole ton of sense for high income individuals to be really happy about high social mobility because it just means that they're more likely over time to fall down the social ladder. But as we saw in study two, people don't really seem to think that they're going to fall down the social ladder. So what we find is that this actually holds across the income spectrum. So when we look back at the uh, national panel data from study four, this is what we see. So consistent with a ton of past research, we see that there's a main effect of income here, such that people who make more money report more positive affect. Uh, we also see the effect of condition, like I described earlier, such that reading the high social mobility article and, and believing uh, there's more social mobility led to, again, increased positive affect. But most interestingly, we don't see an interaction uh, between mobility perceptions and income. So it seems that people are just happier about high social mobility, uh, regardless of their income level. So we have some initial data to suggest that this might be because high income people see high social mobility as the product of, product of, a, of a meritocratic uh, society that really incentivizes hard work. So if, uh, for, for example, that if I'm up at the top of the income spectrum, that just means that, that society, there's lots of social mobility and I worked really hard and I deserve to be up here, so it kind of justifies their position up at the top. So, uh, in sum, what we've seen across studies one and two, that belief in high social mobility appears to be related to higher emotional well-being. And we saw in studies three and four that belief in high social mobility appears to actually lead to higher emotional well-being, as evidenced by the increases in positive affect and decreases in negative affect uh, that we see here. And we also see that this relationship appears to uh, persist right across the income spectrum. So, uh, more broadly speaking, this tolerance for the, the high level of inequality between the rich and the poor, uh, like what Mike talked about earlier, is typically couched in the assumption that uh, there's high equality of opportunity, that everybody can move up the social ladder if they're just willing to uh, put in the work. Um, sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought. Um, if they're willing to put in the work. 
However, we've seen, again, across all three talks today, that people's, people tend to positively skew their perceptions of this inequality, as well as perceptions of their own social mobility, away from these more harsher realities of huge wage gaps and uh, income stickiness. And this, these um, perceptions of higher social mobility appear, again, to lead to uh, increased happiness, which uh, could likely be coming at the cost of a greater tolerance for and less action taken towards these huge income gaps. Uh, so perhaps it's possible that everybody is just happier when they see high social mobility because everybody just kind of feels like this guy here. As a potential lottery winner, I totally support tax cuts for the wealthy. Thank you. <laughs>